my name is Scott Blumenthal. I'm a spine surgeon at the Center for Disc Replacement, Texas Back Institute. And my name is uh, Rick Geyer. I'm Dr. Blumenthal's partner at the Center for Disc Replacement at Texas Back Institute. Today, we want to talk about uh, cervical disc replacement. It's an, it's an interesting technology in that we now have nine artificial discs that have been approved. And there's three more that are in the uh, FDA trials. So it, it's a very interesting technology. And I just want to ask you, Scott, so compared to when we first started doing disc replacement, how, is it, how have you changed your practice? And I mean really our practice in terms of our patient selection. Well, you know, it's, it's a great question. And, and the evolution of a high volume practice like ours it really kind of helps us learn more because there are certain discs that are better for certain types of pathologies. And we've got viscoelastic discs, we've got very unconstrained discs. Um, we found that the applicability to older patients is probably something that we used to stay away from and now we don't. Uh, multiple levels, hybrids, one of the insurers now even approves hybrids, which is, which is interesting. So you can evaluate each disc by level. So certain discs may have a contraindication to arthroplasty, so you'd want to do a, a fusion. Uh, so you know, each patient individualized, each disc level individualized. Yeah, it's interesting because now we have discs that we can use as a salvage for an artificial disc that's more stable. If we have a patient that perhaps has some abnormality in their spinal cord from spinal stenosis that previously we would avoid doing disc replacement. Now we have artificial discs that make very little artifact with the MRI scan, which is a big advantage rather than wondering what's happening to the spinal cord. Is it recovering? Is it not recovering? And with no artifact, which just means um, like scatter or static in the MRI scan, now we can see beautiful images of the spinal cord and also assess how well we've done in decompressing them. And uh, as you said, we've expanded our indications well beyond um, the original FDA uh, accepted indications, uh, not far out, but we're finding that these disc replacements are actually, uh, even for the elderly, have been a great boon for them rather than doing multiple level fusions as we used to do. Well, and, and the other thing that I think is interesting is we've learned that cervical and lumbar behave totally differently. So in other words, in the cervical spine, the facet joints don't seem to be as influential in making a decision as it is in the lumbar. We had a paper last year, the year before, that showed even DEXA scans are not very helpful. Now, I think you have a paper this year on, on sizing. And, and right. Talk about the, the, the sizing. Yeah. So when the cervical artificial disc first came out, they all were measured differently. For example, the average size I would say for most artificial discs was a five or six millimeter. But in reality, in this paper that we're presenting today, we measured the average height of the art of the native disc that is above the level that was replaced and found that the average size was really four millimeters. So there have been a numbered paper showing that if you distract the disc too high, you actually may cause more pain. You can cause what we call heterotopic ossification or calcification in front of the disc. And um, in the study, we found that over 50% of the patients had a four millimeter high disc rather than a five millimeter. So I think there's good evidence that says that you want to maintain that motion and not over distract it. And I think the cervical spine is much more sensitive to the over distraction than the lumbar spine, which of course is a much larger disc area that we replace. No, absolutely. And, and you also mentioned uh, earlier about certain discs are better for revision cases. And I think one thing we've learned is that, like in peripheral joints, you actually can revise these things. It, it's not required frequently, but just because one disc doesn't work or there's an issue down the road, that doesn't necessarily mean the patient goes on to fusion. So compared to when this technology first came out, uh, we're doing a lot more disc-to-disc -disc revisions. Yeah, and, and that's probably the most exciting thing about the cervical artificial disc because you and I have seen many patients that have what we call hypermobility, excessive motion, and they have pain primarily because of the facets are, are not gapping, but they're sliding a lot. And if you put a more stable implant in them, then that patient, rather than being relegated to a fusion, can still have the motion. So it's been a whole new world with the cervical artificial disc in terms of 
the applicability and the number of patients that we can treat with the artificial disc. Let me ask you a question. So we've seen some sporadic reports of fusions being taken down and transformed into an artificial disc. What's your opinion on that? Hype or hope? Uh, no, I think it's hopeful, but I think I have to be very, very careful because uh, if, you, if you're somebody that's had a fusion for years and years and years and the bone is remodeled, I think to take that one down is not, doesn't make sense. But sometimes patients have what we call stable pseudoarthrosis, which means that the, the bone has not fused from one vertebrae to the other. And those patients, I think, are reasonable candidates for the takedown. And we know, listen, we've seen them done and we've done some of them. But I think that the solid fusion, um, I would be a little reluctant, especially if it's been there for years and years. And, and I don't want to mislead the public to thinking that, okay, we're going to take down all fusion to artificial disc. But for a fusion that hasn't healed rock solid or has still motion, um, then I think it's a reasonable option for that patient. Yeah, I, I think you have to be really picky on those because like you said, if the fusion's been there for a long time, many times the facetuants, if they have not been moving for years, will either lose their cartilage or autofuse on their own. And in that case, trying to restore anterior column motion with loss of integrity of the posterior column is not, really not going to do any good. Right. The other neat thing about the uh, current selection of artificial discs we have is that we can really apply them to almost everybody. So why don't you talk about nickel allergy and, and what's our alternative for those patients? Well, again, it, it's interesting. I seem, and we've talked about this, we seem to see more metal allergic patients than we have in the past. And, and maybe it's because we're asking now and we haven't asked previously. But in those circumstances, again, the selection of a prosthesis is incredibly important. And there are, there's a prosthesis that's 100% pure titanium, which you can use, and then obviously the new ceramic on peak discs you can use in those patients. But uh, it's something that we really have to be sensitive to, to ask our patients about. Yeah, and it's much different than in the lumbar disc replacements, whereas we only have two choices, and they're made out of cobalt chrome, they have a little bit of nickel, whereas and nickel allergies you know, most common allergy that patients present with in the cervical spine is no longer it's an issue. We have choices. No, absolutely. And it's a technology that continues to mature. And, uh, you know, I know that there's three new artificial discs that are going through FDA trials, and there's one that um, is made out of a diamond carbon material, which is uh, kind of interesting too. So we're seeing continued refinement. It's almost like the automobile. We started with the Model T and now we have all these supercars out there and you know they keep on changing and getting better and better for our patients. Yeah, it, it's truly a sustainable technology and, and I think we found when we retrospectively looked at patient evaluation for cervical artificial discs, if they're coming to see you and say, Doc, I, I want to see if I'm a candidate for that, about 80% of the time they are. Where lumbar spine, it's not that high because there are more contraindications. But in the cervical spine, I, I would say that for the perfect candidate, it's now the standard of care and really should supplant uh, fusion for the perfect case. The ones we're talking about that may be pushing the envelope a little bit more, I think you could make an argument either way. Yeah, it's interesting because for uh, a herniated disc, it used to be said that the gold standard to, was to have a fusion, but I think that is slowly dissipating away as we have more and more data from all the FDA trials showing the equivalence or better improvement with the cervical artificial disc in terms of preventing adjacent segment disease, which may, means that the levels above and below the artificial disc can degenerate um, at a much lower rate compared to fusion. Fusion patients have a high rate of degeneration, whereas if you maintain the motion, not that it's zero, it's far less. And it makes sense. You know, if you glue two pieces together and it's moving at the level above and below, you're going to have more stress and strain at those levels. Whereas if you have motion at the two levels that you would have fused, you're better off. And, you know, we're believers. We see our patients long term and, and we publish long term data that shows that that is indeed the case. Absolutely. In the longer term data we have, those theoretical survivorship analyses have really turned out to be true. That, and you've already mentioned it, that the chance of needing more surgery with, a, with an artificial disc compared to fusion, somewhere between a third and a fourth. Yeah, and, and it is interesting as the technology gets better and better. For example, of the nine artificial discs that have been approved, there's been 
three that have been retired, not because they were bad, bad discs, it's just that you know, the, the newer disc came out, there was no reason, the companies produced other discs, and uh, so it's exciting technology, and I look forward to the further changes. I mean, ultimately, it would be nice to be able to uh, regenerate the disc or put a, um, you know, maybe an allograph uh, disc taken from a cadaver spine that we could put in there, but I think that's, that is years and years away, but for now, the technology is fantastic. Let's talk about one more thing, just because it's out there as the potential, and you've already alluded to it, is heterotopic ossification. And what we do to reduce the chances, because you can't eliminate them completely, uh, but what steps do you take to mitigate the possibility, and, and then what do you tell patients? Yeah, it, it's a condition in which you form bone in front of the artificial disc. And we have empirically started patients taking over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, either Advil or Aleve, uh, a couple days, one to three days after their surgery and take it for two weeks. We don't have any long-term data, although we will start to look at our data as we've been doing this for a number of years now to see if we actually lessen the chance. But there's also been studies that show that as time goes on, patients do make bone. But the good news is it doesn't seem to affect their clinical outcome. There's different grades of bone formation. Uh, even the grades where there's total bridging of the bone, which would be equivalent to a fusion, those patients continue to do well. That's not what we want to do with the artificial disc, but the grade three where they have, you know, some bone spurs in front, they still have motion and they're still doing well. So it's not a, a terrible thing. Uh, we don't want to see the grade, what we call the grade four or the auto fusion. But when I tell patients, should it occur, and should it occur at 10 years, that was 10 more years that they had motion with less stress on the levels above and below. And the other technical thing that we try to do is try to uh, minimize bone bleeding. So in other words, if you're doing a keeled prosthesis, put bone wax in the keeled cut. If you take some anterior osteophytes, put bone wax over where you've resected. And personally, I try to avoid using the burr on artificial discs because of the creation of bone ridge. And if you do, do 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 that, make sure you irrigate out all kind of the yeah we the, we, bone, the bone dust. Although we have some um, you know of our friends that also do artificial discs that do use a lot of burr, we tend not to. We like just the manual instruments, and as you say, we. Even the uh, bone spurs that are in the front of the spine, those will usually melt away with, with time. And that's the opposite of HO or heterotopic ossification. It's actually you get some bone resorption in the very front. So the front of the vertebral body will remodel. And uh, that's usually not an issue. Yeah. And, and finally, the, the last thing is there has to be, as in everything in medicine, a genetic component. There are some people that are just bone formers. And, and frankly, I've, I've learned the lesson the hard way of an adjacent segment disc of a patient that's had grade four HO, done another, another artificial disc, and guess what? They get the same thing with the most meticulous technique I can try. Some patients are just gonna form it based on you know, and, their genetics. And you know, Scott, it, it's not always, <laughs> it doesn't always follow the rules because I've had a patient exactly the opposite, where he got HO on the first one, and I did do it on the second one. so. When I did the second one, he still had motion at the very first one. The first one went on to complete ossification or fusion. The second one maintained its motion in long term. So, you know, there's so much we don't know about the human body and the genetics. There we go. We've solved it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, everybody.